2, verses 1 through 11. It's a long text. Don't be nervous. We're not going to get through all of it this morning. That's okay. I want to welcome every single one of you to Big Woods Bible Church. If you are visiting with us for the very first time, a special, special welcome to you. You ever have one of those mornings like I had this morning where you just like, you just, you just, like nothing in your, nothing seems to go smooth. You like want to pull your hair out and then you realize I was talking to Matt, and he said, Pastor, just wait for the first song. And I want to thank you, Matt, and I want to thank every single one of you as you lifted up your voices. And together, we sang, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Nothing else matters. Not, nothing else matters. Do you realize that? That together our hearts are knit together with one thought, that we are in the presence of a holy God. Oh, and it makes it so worth it. We have been blessed. I have been blessed by his grace to have another day. We have woken up. We are together in the Lord's house the Lord's day, lifting up voices of God's holiness, and we rejoice in that. Thank you for ministering already to my soul, but thank the Lord first and foremost for his holiness. We have been involved in this study um, for quite some time. I, I, I think, I hope, you're kind of getting like the big idea of the major theme to this book of Philippians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. Um, verse 4 of the very first chapter, chapter 1, verse 4, making my prayer with joy. Um, uh, Christ is proclaimed in that I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Chapter 1, verse 18, for your joy in the faith. Chapter 1, verse 25. Uh, chapter 2, verse 2, complete my Joy, chapter 2, verse 17, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Uh, chapter 2, verse 18, be glad and rejoice with me. And, and we will continue on and we'll see many more references surrounded around this one subject about having joy within, to rejoice and be glad. It's that word caro, it's 24 times it's used in these Four chapters in this one book of Philippians. So, so we get it, okay? We've been learning, regardless of like circumstances, wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Regardless what, rejoice. Paul models this for us. Doesn't matter how it looks on the outside. It looks pretty bleak and blurry out there. Have joy. I know you hear that and you're like, all right, all right, all right. I got it, okay? Enough. But how, how, how do I do this? How, how do I rejoice when I am unsettled within? How do I really have joy when I feel so sad about circumstances around me? How do I rejoice when I'm scared, when I'm stressed, like many People are today. How do I rejoice? How do I really have joy when, when I just I feel horrible? I'm sick. How, how do I rejoice? I've got I've got bills to pay and I've got pressure on me. I've got work to do. The kids the kids are driving me crazy and I got to worry about them. The car's not working right. My marriage is flat. My job's a bore. And now I'm told, just rejoice. Just be glad. Today, this morning, this morning, we turn the corner. We turn the corner to a new chapter. And we will learn how, how we really get to what I call our first portion of theology in the book of Philippians. And Lord willing, we will learn the big idea that we are honestly able to rejoice in the righteousness of Christ. 
when we rest, when we have confidence in His work and what He has done, and not, not our own work. So I want you to follow along. Um, We'll pick it up in verse 1 of Philippians chapter 3. Again, I said a a long text. We're going to read 11 verses. Not going to be able to cover it all this morning. The words will be ahead of you on the screen. I'm reading from the ESV. It says this. Finally, 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 my brothers, I rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me. And it's, it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil doers. Look, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision. Who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Pause. If you have a pen or a highlighter, I'd encourage you to write in your Bible and underline that phrase, glory in Christ Jesus. Glory in Christ Jesus. And put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith, in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The word of the Lord. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we are humbled, most humbled, to come into your presence, you who alone deserve and receive all glory, you alone who are holy above anything and everyone. We come, Lord, on this first Sunday of a new year. We come, Lord, and if we are honest in our hearts, in the depths, the deepest parts, the crevices and corners that no one else sees. There's hurt. There's anger. There's frustration. There's worry. There's just uncertainty and pressures as far as we don't know what's next and what's going to happen. There's heartache and sadness. There's the fret of illness and sickness. And Lord, right now, we, we acknowledge that. We acknowledge, Lord, the fact that you know us. That you care for us and that you love us. And you've shown that love for us by offering your own son, Jesus. And we come to you in his name, asking that you would awaken and quicken our heart and our soul, and our mind, to, Lord, hear a word that you want us to hear. Lord, I plead, please, please give me the help that I need. Thank you for every person that's here. May your spirit go to work on our souls. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the author 
the Apostle Paul explains to us how. How we go about having this joy that is this theme we see all the way through. Three points. I'm going to give you the first point is that he gives to us a word of warning. We see this in just the first couple verses. I don't know really if we're going to get much further than this today. So it begins with this word, finally. You know when you hear a, a, a preacher and he's preaching and, and throughout the message and he goes, finally, well guess what? This does not mean that things are coming to an end. Paul's not getting ready to close his letter here. He's actually making a transition to another major subject. Sometimes it's actually translated instead of finally, furthermore, or I've got this to say, I've got this to add. And he repeats it. Here's this word again. Here it is again. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And the author adds what? It's, it's no trouble for me. In fact, he says, it's a safe thing. It's, it's a good thing for me to write this to you and to even repeat these words. Why? Because it's needed and important. What, what does he write? Three times you will hear these two words as one phrase. Three times. Yeah. Three times in three verses, you want to pay attention to it, all right? When you hear the same phrase three times in one verse, you know what that means? You better drop everything. And you listen up. The author is starting out and he warns us, look out for dogs, evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. Now let me, let me clarify some thinking. This is not speaking about the dog that you're thinking about, that yapping, snarling, ugly, aggressive canine. This is actually a metaphor that Paul is using to intentionally, what, strong language to describe what to the Philippians about false teachers. That's what he's calling them. He's name calling here. Specifically, the false teachers are known as Judaizers. They're people who followed the Apostle Paul around, much like the, the, the religious right followed Jesus around in his ministry. And what they're doing is they're presenting purposely and negatively what? Impact of others by presenting a false gospel. They're following the, the Apostle Paul around when he was in ministry. And this isn't a problem that's just, just limited to the Philippians. The Galatians certainly faced this. Presenting a false gospel, untruth. And what they were presenting very specifically is that in order to be saved, in order to have a relationship with a holy God and go to heaven, it was going to take faith plus works, good works. It was going to take faith plus adherence to the law. Faith plus circumcision. And Paul is stating here, he's warning that false teachers, false teaching are not only bothersome, they're not only troublesome, but they're dangerous. That's why he calls them evil and he calls them dogs because a dog in first century Middle Eastern culture and context is not what we're thinking of today. Okay, when you hear the word dog, you tend to think of what? Something cute, something cuddly, a little puppy that's snuggling up with you on a couch. Not snuggling up with me, but maybe some of you. We hear the word dog and we tend to think about, well, didn't we just hear about this Westminster dog show and the winner, I remember it announced, the winner is Flynn the Bichon. Or, or just recently we heard about the AKC winner is Whiskey the Whippet. These are like real names. That's the best they could come up with. Dog's worth a half a million dollars and they name them Whiskey. See, that's what we, when we hear this word dog, but it's, it's, not, it's not like that. Paul's intentionally using this term, he refers to false teachers as dogs. He's thinking about the fact that, that dogs at this time and this place were filthy. They were unclean. They carried diseases. 
They could attack you, bite you. They're vicious and dangerous. And he's saying this, avoid them. Just stay away from them. Let me stop right here. I know what you're thinking. I, I'm, I am ahead of you, okay? Work on this. I know what you're thinking. Uh, Pastor Tim, I don't, Pastor Tim, I don't want to burst your bubble on this whole like idea of the message or the big idea to this text. But I don't see a lot of snarling dogs out there today. Don't want don't to hurt your feelings, Pastor Tim, but I don't really know of a lot of false teachers that are following us around trying to bite us or hurt us at Big Woods Bible Church in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. And, and by the way, I'm kind of offended that you would include Flynn the Bichon in the same conversation with some mangy street dog. That's kind of how I'm feeling this morning. Let, let, let me just, just so that you hear me very clearly. So I, want, I want to say it, I want to say it, if you're thinking that, I want to be as politely as possible, okay? I, I want to be, because I'm concerned. If you think, like, there's nobody following us wrong, yapping at us, let me be polite here. You are dead wrong. You are dead wrong to think that. You are 100% wrong to think that there are not false teachers or there is not false teaching that there's not dangerous influences that can lead you away from the truth if you think that that doesn't exist then you are totally wrong you can be assured of this just as the enemy was using what bad theology bad teaching in first century philippi to disrupt and distort the work of the gospel you can be assured that the enemy is still using bad theology, bad teaching, bad influences in 21st century Pennsylvania. Right here, right now. As a matter of fact, I would even go so far as to say more than ever before. And guess what? It's more accessible than ever before. It's literally, literally at this moment at your fingertips. At your fingertips. This is fun. I actually Googled this week. Okay, I don't, I don't do this very like, huh, I wonder what I should preach on. Let's, let's try Google. And I, and I Googled this question, okay? I'm like, how to get to heaven? That's pretty broad, right? Just how, like, what would be the response out there? What kind of fills my screen with this one question, how do I get to heaven? And you will find, just with that one question, you will find a plethora of bad theology. And it's easy, like, like, what, like, what do I believe here? What's right and what's wrong? People are doing that all the time. They have no clue as far as discernment, biblical discernment. It quickly reveals what we hear every day. The first things that come up, here's, here's number one. The best ways... To get to heaven, plural, which automatically are saying, well, you know, there's several different ways. Bad theology. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus Christ says. Another one that pops up. How to get to heaven according to the Bible. Which apparently there's other ways to get to heaven according to other holy books that exist out there. No, no, no. Bad teaching. I was intrigued by this one. How to get to heaven without dying. Here's what the rather flowery response that I read. You are a microcosm of the macrocosm. That you are to just journey within your inner self and use your third eye. This is a direct quote. Use what the ancients call your active imagination or pretend. Start with breathing. And you'll make it to heaven. I'm, I'm sorry, gang. It doesn't work like that. This one struck my mind by way of rather interesting. How to stay qualified for heaven. How to stay qualified for heaven. I was like, wow. So what is this about? And I quote, some Christians say that a Christian is once saved, always saved. But if you look at the Bible, it would seem that one salvation 
isn't quite as secure as some think it is. So apparently they're even quoting the Bible in some bad theology. Do you realize that the enemy knows the word of God better than you do? And he uses it, twists it, and distorts it. And there's a long list here of how to be, how to stay qualified for heaven. Here's, here's at the top of the list. Be pure. That's pretty simple. Don't, don't be sexually immoral or commit adultery. It says nothing about the fact that in our hearts we regularly lust after the flesh, which is sin. Here's another one. How, how, to, how to stay qualified? Be straight. Don't practice homosexuality. doesn't talk about the fact that, that there's all types of other sexual sins out there that people are committing. But as long as you are this, what? Work for your money. Number five, don't steal. Don't be a swindler. Right, number six, be, be generous. Don't be greedy. Number seven, be sober. Don't be a drunkard. Number eight, speak well of others. Don't slander others. Number nine, make peace. Now, they're all really, really good things. But I know people who have done all of these things and have denied the full finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, what was accomplished on the cross. How to stay qualified for heaven when the truth is what none of us can do anything to stay qualified or be qualified for heaven. Why? Because it is what Christ has done. Plain and simple. And it is our faith in Christ's full finished work on the cross and the tomb that gifts us in his grace eternity with him. You see, this is, what, this is what Martin Luther was so disturbed about when he, when he discovers what? In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, he's trying to do everything perfectly righteous. And he realizes in his heart, he's still far. Romans chapter 1, verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And it is writ, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The only thing, the only thing is resting entirely. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you're saved through faith. It's a gift, not of your works. You can be assured, just as the enemy was using bad theology in first century Philippi, he is still using bad theology in 21st century Pennsylvania, right here, right now. So like, okay, so what do we do? What, like, what do we do with that? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that question because the answer, well, here's the answer. Here's the answer. This is what Paul says. He says, look out, look out, be aware. For those who mutilate the flesh, this is a play on words describing the emphasis on a physical act for salvation that really is of no eternal value. Matter of fact, Paul says this, instead, get this, we are, you are the circumcision. Well, that's a rather interesting term. It's interesting that we don't see that term in a lot of our church promotional material anywhere, do we? We, we like other like pictures of the body of Christ. We're the bride and we're the temple. We're the building, we're the flock, we're the field. No, no, here it says, you're actually the circumcision. He adds to that, he says, we are those who worship by the Spirit of God and glory. We glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. It is no secret that we live in a world that is screaming, screaming at you. But that, that you can, as a matter of fact, you should have confidence in your own flesh. That you should glory in your own works. A popular religious philosophy today is what is that the Lord helps those who helps themselves. And so there's kind of this, this, this 
dual work that has to take place. A woman was speaking to our pastor, and she was trying to understand it, and she said, so if I get it like this, it's kind of like um, in order to go to heaven, it's like we're, we're in a rowboat. And, and, and one oar that we're rowing is faith, and the other oar that we're rowing is works. And we have to row them both in order to get somewhere. If not, we just kind of go around in circles. Pastor said, kind of, but no one's going to heaven in a rowboat. And I think that's the most accurate. That's the most accurate. So today we hear what? We hear this term, this is my truth. We hear this term, this is, this is their truth. His truth, her truth, their truth. We don't hear a lot about the truth. So what? You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't do anything that, that you don't want to. To do, No one ever tells you what you can or cannot do because that's squashing you, that's suppressing you in, in some way. And so you dream whatever it is, the sky is the limit, it's the world that we live in. You, you only live once, YOLO. It's all about you. And we hear those things, and with those things, others are saying... You are hearing, and sadly, many people are believing. Give no thought to the glory that rightfully belongs to Christ. Whenever you hear that, you're hearing someone tell you, you give no thought to give any glory to that which whom it rightfully belongs. I keep these words literally next to me. In my office, in Ephesians, it says in, in chapter 3, in verse 20 and 21, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory. Underline that. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. See, what, what we are instructed to do oftentimes by the influence of this world is that you glory in your own self, in your own strengths. You glory in your own gifts. You glory in your own talents. You, you glory in, in your own right living or your own righteousness. People, whenever you, whenever you hear that, you have to understand what, what is it that Paul tells the Philippians? No. No. What is it the Holy Spirit this morning is telling you and I this morning? No. Put no confidence in the flesh. Put no confidence in the flesh. This is so important. Why? Because you cannot have joy. You, you, you cannot rejoice in the righteousness of Christ's work if you put confidence in your own flesh. Remember, remember back all the way up our very first Sunday in this beautiful uh, worship facility? It was the end of September, I believe, and I introduced to you the whole book of Philippians and talked about the reason that we are living in a world that is just lacking joy. And we talked about the, the initial definition of, of joy. Do you remember that? You're like, of course I remember that. It was only three months ago. Let me, let me just remind you, just in case it's a little foggy, the true biblical definition of joy is the settled conviction that God sovereignly controls all circumstances. There's a settled conviction that God, who is in his sovereign reign rule over everything, controls all circumstances for a believer's good and his glory. All circumstances, all circumstances. Wait a minute, even the hardship and the hard, harshness and the horror that they pressed on the Lord Jesus Christ himself when they nailed him to a cross? You mean all circumstances? Yes, all circumstances. 
because he did that on our behalf. That what we can be set free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. That we what? That we can be healed by his stripes. Isaiah writes in chapter 53, by his stripes. By, by, by that's literally the, 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 the marking from being whipped and his flesh torn. By those stripes on his body, you and I are made whole. We are healed. That we could have life and have it more abundantly, John says in, in chapter 10, verse 10. All circumstances, even the horrors that Christ faced on our behalf. For our sake, he made him to be sin. He knew no sin. That in him, we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. You see, God works all circumstances. And I know I'm not taking anything away from some of the hardship or even horrors that you're facing right now. But a sovereign God is in control. And have hope that he's doing something in your life that ultimately can work for your good. Maybe it's you being drawn in closer relationship to him. And ultimately all of it for his glory. So this morning we need to, to put, what? Take all the outward circumstances. I'm sad. I'm so sad. I'm scared. I'm stressed. I'm sick. Take all those aside. What do we know? Inwardly, that upon our faith, that is when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, who paid the price for our sins when he died on the cross. We know that when we submit, we surrender to him as Lord. Admit the fact, you, you kind of navigate your own life, and it's a mess. Some of you at this very moment can give testimony of that. When you surrender and say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm just screwing up. That God has a, an amazing plan. And when we put our trust in Christ and submit to him as Lord, that he literally indwells us, that God takes up residence. The Holy Spirit within us produces, he produces not only a joy, but a peace. Oh, it's, just, it's so lacking in our world today. The Holy Spirit produces not only a, a joy, but a peace in our lives to move forward just one more day for His glory. You, you realize that's what it is. How do, we, how, do we, like, how do we apply this, though? Like, 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 what do we put in our pocket and take home? Let me ask you, let me leave finally... Let, let, let me leave you with this thought. What do you have confidence in? Think of it like this. Like, what are you, what are you banking on? You, you know, when things maybe aren't going quite the way that you thought they were going to go, when things really start to go south, or even start to lean that way, what is your, what is your automatic kind of default. Yeah, it's not going well, but things will be okay because what? I'm young. <laughs> I used to be. Yeah, yeah, it's not going the way I thought, but you know what? I'm strong. Uh, yeah, I used to be. It doesn't last real long. Yeah, but you know, it's not going real well, but I got a plan here in my back pocket. I'm, I'm, Gift it. My teacher told me that. They put me in this row of students. And so I got my smarts to lean on. Things don't go real well. Yeah, but you know what? I've been, I've been faithful at church. I haven't done any time for killing anybody. So that in some way becomes our automatic default. Do you know, have you ever heard of this term? Do you know what a, you know what a, go bag is you got your go bag i had no I, the first time i ever heard this term a go bag was way back this is before some of you healthy young strong people were born the first time i heard this phrase go bag was was like like 
middle part of 1999. I know that's going back. Because there was this, there was this idea that computers that are reading all the dates, like 1997, 1998, 1999, are not, are not able, they've not been programmed to handle the transition from 1999 to the year 2000. And so it was called Y2K. And they had this idea that because computers are going to crash on, on New Year's Eve, there's going to be a complete meltdown. It's going to be like a brownout. And they had this long list of bank accounts. Your bank accounts are going to freeze. They said that air traffic control goes down and everything goes wild, haywire, and planes are going to be crashing. First responders don't have contact. They won't be able to respond. Cars will lock people out of them. And the results is going to be rioting. And there's going to be looting. And then our enemies will like hear this. Well, apparently their computers worked. And so they're going to take advantage of us and, and attack us. There's going to be nuclear attacks. And the whole thing was just going to be apocalyptic. So you had to be ready. You had to have a go bag. In your go bag, you were to put your first aid kit. That was supposed to be in there. Some dried meat, some dried fruit, because that would like last long, taste horrible, but it's going to last a long time if this, thing, if this thing doesn't. You're supposed to have, no joke, you're supposed to have a gun and some ammo. Not quite sure why. You're supposed to have some cash and batteries. I don't know what the batteries were for, but it was on the list. We tried, I mean, we tried our go bag, okay? We had literally, we had like 20 bucks, some toilet paper, and a couple TV dinners. Like our go bag was pathetic. But everyone else had to have one. So we were with the group. Everything just melts down. But I got my Band-Aids, I got my beef jerky, I'm good to go. And then, as we all sat, 10, 9, 8, 7. Apparently, there were still parties in New York. But up in northern Maine, it was going to be rough. 3, 2, 1. And we were still there. And it said like 1201. And, and it was this whole idea like, wait a minute, like what about, we, we just ate our TV dinners the next day. No joke. We just ate our TV dinners. Like this is cool. And then, then I, I remember if nothing happened, the phrase came up again after, do you remember 9-11? And we didn't know what was next. Like people really didn't know what was next. And then that phrase you got, you got to be ready. you gotta, got to get ready. You realize that people today are doing the exact same thing. Exact same thing. They are clinging to, holding on to uh, what? Their stuff, their self, their strengths. You've got experience. I'm going to put that in my go bag. i got some, I got some wits about me. i got skills. So people are banking on those things. Yeah, I don't really know my, my, my life's a, a wreck, but I, I got a really good 401k and, and I got a security plan. Well, God gifted me with a great personality and, and I can read the room well. I've heard people use all kinds of things that that's their what? That's their automatic default. I got a cool family. Praise God, you got a cool family. That's not going to help you when it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, judgment. Yeah, but I can sing. I can, I can dance. I throw a nasty slide in. Whatever it is, I bake a really wonderful apple pie. No, no, none of it, none of it, none of it's going to be good enough. Because we are not good enough. 
You see, there's bad theology, there's bad teaching that exists all over the place. And sadly, a lot of people who call themselves followers of Jesus are buying into it. That's our first point of this message, and we'll call it there. Because I think just when you hold on to this, this word of warning, you need, to be, you need to be alert. Dads, fathers, single moms, you're raising your children. You're responsible to guard. What are the influences? What, 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 what are the, 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 the teachings? What are you allowing into your home, into your mind, into your children's hearts? We have to hold on to, we have to hold on to the full truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul goes on and he says what? I call it a word of testimony. We'll look at a word of instruction over the next couple of weeks. Paul says if anybody had a reason to brag, his, his go bag was packed. It still wasn't enough. Why? Because our reminder this morning is that we glory in Christ Jesus. We glory in Christ Jesus. We have been blessed by his grace and gifting us in amazing, wonderful ways. But there is no greater gift than the gift of salvation that is offered when we put our full faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept him as Lord. Submit to him. Allow the Holy Spirit to produce not only a joy, but a settled peace in your life. To enable us, equip us for one more day to live for his glory. Father, we love you. I love you. I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this text. I pray, Lord, as we unpack it over the next couple of weeks, that you would just illuminate, open our minds, our hearts, our ears, and our eyes to hear and to see you, to know the truth, and to rest in the fact that you, you alone,